Good evening. If you're ill, you call the doctor. When the pipes burst, it's the plumber. But who are you going to call if you see a ghost? If you've seen the movie, you'll know the answer. It's the ghost buster. A paranormal investigator, Andrew Green, doesn't advertise in the yellow pages. He doesn't need to. His reputation travels by word of mouth. He's had calls from all sorts of people, local councils, even the Royal Albert Hall. The reason for asking me to come along is to get confirmation of what they feel. Confirmation from the outside, confirmation from somebody who's gained some sort of knowledge and understanding of the paranormal to confirm what they believe. I'm not what people would say a clairvoyant or a spiritualistic medium. I am, I like to think, a scientifically minded investigator. Staff at a Margate fun fair have been reporting strange experiences and Ghostbuster Andrew Green has been called in to investigate. All of a sudden, the whole area became very, very cold, which was quite strange because we had heaters to keep the place warm and so on. All the lights that were on the side of the uh, skating rink actually burst and smashed all over the floor. Um, looking at this and thinking about what was happening, we thought, God, you know, let's get out of here because it was so frightening. There was no, no answer at all to it. It, it, it just happened. This is the second time the fairground have called upon Andrew Green's services. Problems have intensified since the building last year of a new attraction, the Stowaway Ride. It was a rush job to get the ride open and the contractors were asked to work through the night. And on one or two occasions, they downed tools and went home. They refused to work because of sensations and cold feelings and things that were happening to them. They never found any explanation for them? No, they didn't stay long enough. One of Green's most prestigious clients is the Royal Albert Hall. He was called in last year to deal with a rash of sightings by staff when the public had all gone home. Security guard Diane Baylor was patrolling with her partner Terry Riley. They were completely alone in the hall. At least that's what they thought. I'm standing right next to you. How could it have been? Well, what was it then? Well, I don't know. Perhaps somebody's in the building. Could have been a person. It was much too forceful for that. Come on, let's have a look. I thought I was playing a joke, but I was too close to him anyway. And I couldn't have physically done it. I, I don't think there's anybody I know that's strong enough to do that to a door. Uh, when you get out of the window. doors, you can see possibly it's funny that 30 it's yards each side. Somebody must be and there was nobody in there and I mean it was only I've had to go five yards so seconds, there's no way that anybody could have seconds. got out of sight in that length of time it was quite strange very strange <laughs> but there was more to come for Terry and Diane that night Royal Phil wasn't in the hall last time I looked. Do you think somebody could have the radio on somewhere? It sounded very orchestral, but um, very faint, wasn't mm -hmm. it? But definitely you could make out that it was, it was definitely music. Come on. We mm. rushed along, didn't we, to see if we could hear it louder someplace mm. else. Frightened? I wouldn't say frightened. No, but just more apprehensive. Yeah, <laughs> a little unsettling, I think. Other staff report a presence they felt when alone at night in the hall. I was taking a shortcut across a room called the garden room. It's a room that's always been a little bit uh, spooky. I walked into the room. 
and I became aware that there was someone behind me. I turned round and there was no one there. Then I thought I heard footsteps. I turned round again. There was no one there. And at this point, I began to feel uneasy. I had a very strong feeling that there was someone behind me um, at my left shoulder here, and that their face was so close that I could hear them breathing. I believe in ghosts only as a form of electromagnetic energy that can be seen at certain times and more especially by certain people. The mind's got to be blank, it has got to be receptive to that particular part of the electromagnetic wavelength. Andrew Green combed the Royal Albert Hall to see if he could detect any trace of whatever it was that was troubling staff. So as I got to about here, I was definitely aware of somebody coming into the room behind me. That's extraordinary. What? Temperature seems to have gone right up. It was 72, now it's 81. You had new heating installed? No, the temperature's constant in this part of the building. Seems to be a hot spot right here. I felt quite pleased that he'd discovered something, in a way, because it made me feel even more that my experience hadn't been imagination, that there was something behind it. Andrew Green's investigations convinced him that the Albert Hall was indeed haunted. But he told staff there was no need to worry. I advise people that it is irrational to be frightened by seeing a ghost because it is merely a form of electrical energy, like an image on a television set. That can't harm you. But sometimes people's experiences of what they believe to be paranormal forces can be too disturbing to dismiss lightheartedly. Many former landlords of the Seven Stars pub in Robertsbridge, Sussex, say the pub is haunted. The problems for Mike Pierce and his wife Christine began in their very first week. You got in bar snacks ready yet, love? Oh, hang on a minute. I'm going as quick as I can. Mike came up and said, what on earth's going on up here? And there's all the mugs all smashed and I, I was nowhere near it and there wasn't any vibrations, no trembles, no doors banging, nothing. Initially skeptical about the pub's reputation, Mike soon had an experience of his own. I've got a very good sense of hearing, very uh, sensitive. And I could hear a, um, a mumbling sound. I detected that it was coming from the cellar like a party was going on. I opened the door to the cellar, and as I opened it, there was a whoosh. It was like mayhem being let loose inside the cellar. I thought, well, I must be a bad person. You know, maybe this is done because uh, I've been a bad person. You don't like me. Oh, Mike, I tell you. The mess in here. It was hard enough. As the problems mounted, the Christine Pierce called in What's Andrew the Green. Ghost frightening the life out of you. What we've got to do is try and understand the root of it. Um, let's carry on with the kitchen incident. Yeah, well, but for once, the investigator turned witness. And Mike was in the bar. He was polishing the glasses. When... What's he doing? He's supposed to be stuffing up in there. Bundles of the local free newspaper stored right. in the cellar had come loose from their bindings. Christine! Newspapers were flying around all over the place. Now, he couldn't blow them around. You know, it's, it's impossible. I observed this 
um, and noted it as yet another incident of paranormality in the seven stars. Green told Mike and Christine that a poltergeist was responsible for the phenomena they were experiencing. He tried to explain to me that with the poltergeist activity, you've got to be stronger than what's there. Um, if, if you're a weak person and you let it get to you, then it carry on and on. When the mugs came flying off the shelf a second time, Christine knew what to do. This time, I remember what Andrew had said to me, and I had a good swear and told it that I wasn't going to get out and it wasn't going to drive me out, and that's all there was to it. And um, I actually physically didn't have any more poltergeist activity happen to me in the pub ever again. <laughs> But the Dreamland file remains open, and Andrew Green settles in for a long vigil in the stowaway ride. What I'm going to try to do is to see if there's any build-up of electricity in this area, which may account for that sort of phenomena. Um, well, that's peculiar. Um, there's only water down there. Is there any cables underneath there, do you know of? No, the nearest electric cable is about two metres away from here. And yet there's build-up of electricity. This really is most peculiar. Because the build-up of static electricity, as that is indicated, does suggest that there's something unusual in this area which could account for this sort of phenomena. Green's investigations produced this one positive finding. The ride, he believes, may well be haunted. But his advice remains the same. Don't worry about ghosts. They never hurt anyone. It's only the living that do that. Since Andrew Green's visit to the fun fair, no more hauntings have been reported. It seems he might have spooked the spooks. Anyone who has a pet knows that animals possess extraordinary senses which have evolved far beyond our own. A dog with its powerful sense of smell and acute hearing can not only tell whether its owner has been in a room, but how long ago he or she was there? His ears will pick up the most distant sounds, like the rattle of a lead, which would be imperceptible to us. But can animals possess a sixth sense, one which actually enables them to perceive what is about to happen? Tiki is a Cavalier King Charles. He's very friendly, very good-natured. He's a very clever dog, and he's definitely our hero, and there's something special about him. We were taking him for his normal walk along the disused railway line, where we normally take him quite often. We were walking along, everything was fine. He just suddenly stopped and wouldn't let us walk on. He refused to let us carry on walking. He was grabbing his legs, barking, and he was just adamant that we weren't going to carry on. It was like he knew something was going to happen and he just wouldn't let us carry on. We bent down to see what was wrong with him. Um, you know, just kind of trying to calm him down, saying, what's wrong, Tiki, what's the matter? Then there was a loud crack. If Tiggy hadn't done that, we would have walked on and been almost directly under the branch um, by the time it cracked, so it could have fallen on our heads and, you know, injured us very badly or even killed us. When the branch fell, I, I thought it was really strange. I was quite shocked and amazed because I, I realised that Tiggy knew this was going to happen and it, and it really shocked us. We call him our psychic pet. Many scientists would explain away Tiggy's so-called premonition as mere coincidence, but his story does not stand alone. That day when Shauna pulled me out of the way, she saved my life. I was taking Shana for a walk and uh, we was walking along the footpath by a car dealers and all of a sudden she dived between the two parked cars and pulled me with her. This van mounted the footpath where we were going to walk along the footpath. So I don't know whether she had a premonition or a sixth sense but she just sort of pulled me out of the way and in fact she saved my life really. Sadly, Shana has since died. Shep was a Shetland sheepdog and 
I had him for 15 years. He was eight weeks old when I got him. And he was a great dog. I owe my life to him, really. Come on, then, Chip. I used to walk him first thing in the morning. And this particular morning, I came down, and I was surprised to see Come that when I came in, that walk? he stayed where he was and wouldn't move. What's the matter? Shep refused his walk for ten minutes before suddenly jumping out of his basket and trotting to the back door. And as I got out onto the main road, I saw there'd been an accident on our side of the road, on the side that I was walking on, and the car had gone across out of control over the grass verge, across the pavement, and had crashed into the wall. The accident had happened ten minutes earlier. Had Shep got up at the time I first came down to give him his walk, I would almost certainly have been squashed by this car. I believe he had a, a sixth sense and maybe he knew that something was, was happening or about to happen. There are many testimonies to the predictive powers of animals, but the phenomenon has only recently caught the interest of scientists. I think that in some of these cases, at least, the dog probably is showing some real sense of premonition. Nobody knows how premonitions can work, but pets do seem to have them. Pets aren't able to predict or prevent tragedies. What happens is that we forget all of the times when the, when the dog didn't want to go out for a walk. And we remember that one occasion when it didn't want to go out for a walk and there was a tragedy on the street. There's no doubt that compared to humans, many animals have what we could call super sensory perception. They can hear things that we can't hear. They can smell things that we can't smell, and under some circumstances, they can see things that, that we can't see. So they may be able to detect things that we're completely unaware of. But that's very different from extrasensory perception, the ability to look into the future. That's something that has been studied to see whether animals are able to do this, and there has been no conclusive scientific proof to show that that is the case. Whatever the truth, believers have yet to prove the predictive powers of animals. But the owners of pets who've saved lives won't be dissuaded that they have borne witness to pet premonitions. Of course, if animals could talk and we could understand them, we could settle the question once and for all. I found him very amazing, very spooky, almost like something like the X-Files, you know. If he's not genuine, He's, one, he's the best con man I think I've ever met in my life. John Starkey believes he can talk to animals. I think everyone can do it. I think it's a matter of training your mind to be able to do it. Drayton Manor Zoo in Tamworth is home to 300 animals, including lions, tigers, and the majestic black panther or leopard. Zig, a male black or melanized leopard, has now been with the zoo for five years. Zig was very sort of antisocial at first. He wasn't a particularly nice, nice tempered animal. But Zig used to get up on a platform and pace up and down, up and down. It's not the sort of situation we like. It shows that the animal is showing stress. We tried everything, everything to try and stop it. We altered the layout of his enclosure. Um, we you know, we tried varying his feeding times at various times. We tried hanging his food from the roof of the enclosure, all the usual tricks. John Foden also consulted animal behaviorists, but nothing seemed to work. By chance, animal psychic John Starkey got to hear of Zig's problem. Well, we tried everything else. Let's see what he makes of the leopard. I wondered if I could help, um, and, you know, just sort of try to sort out what we could do. Before introducing John Starkey to Zig, John Foden decided to test him. Esther's a Burmese giant tortoise. I thought, I'll throw an animal, a very unlikely animal at him. What can he make of a tortoise, you know? Yeah. She was wonderful because she was still motionless and yet told me she got a problem with one of her legs. She's a very old tortoise and she got arthritis and she works with a limp, but John hadn't seen the tortoise move. You know, that, that got me going to start with, you know. Intrigued by this insight into Esther, Foden decided it was time for Starkey to meet Zig. The leopard immediately approached him, which is very unusual for Zig. You know, he's normally very hostile to close contact. We were able to get close with eye contact, and that was the thing, really, that revealed the secrets later. Zig was just sort of responding, look at him, and just went very, very quiet, you know, very, very docile. It's, very, it's weird. 
the thing that I did more than anything was focused on his eyes uh, and just allowed him to sort of relax with me and then tried to pick up things from there. He told me that he'd seen something very tragic and uh, it occurred to me that there were all sorts of things that were causing behavioral problems there. Zig, I thought, was traumatized by that. Starkey claimed that Zig had told him he was suffering from the loss of his mate. The zoo have since established that Starkey was correct. Before Zig's arrival, he had once been separated from a mate. It surprised me, yes, yeah. But having said that, he did look like he was looking for something. John Starkey warned the zoo that there would be no shortcut to Zig's recovery. But he said the leopard's misery would pass in time. The leopard is getting better, you know, he's, we no, no longer class Zig as, as a problem animal. Can animals talk to us? John Foden is not the only zookeeper who believes that Starkey can understand what they're saying. Yolanda Serkov owns a zoo in Essex. When John Starkey came, I thought initially it was going to be a waste of time. I've got, did not believe in anything of it at all. And I thought, right, well, we'll see if we can catch him out. I gave him this goat to look at and to talk to. And after a few minutes, he turned around and he said that the goat had told him that she'd spent all her time in a stable, her feet were hurting her, where the owners hadn't treated them at all. And that was perfectly true. I just could not believe what I was hearing. Absolutely astounded. I think John Starkey could be a Dr. Doolittle. I think animals are probably more psychic than human beings. I think they have powers which we've lost in the course of our evolution and living in cities and modern education and so on. These things have suppressed our powers. So I think that if we're going to study psychic phenomena, the best place to look for them is in animals. By the way, John Starkey and the zookeepers were qualified to pass through the safety barrier. But if you take a trip to the zoo, Samwell back, even psychic animals can have very sharp teeth and a nasty bite. Good night. <laughs>